That's the first bit. <laughs> um, I want to start off talking about Handheld Heart first as what it was when I started it um, and what my intentions were when I did start it. And, and sort of later on, I'll sort of explain on what it's evolved to, to, to what it is now. I started Handheld Heart uh, originally in, in 1998 as an independent record label, which at the time I, I sort of had no interest in design. I was designing things, but I really didn't know what design was. I had always sort of been a creator, but my knowledge of design was sort of nothing. So at this time, what I was more focused on was, was music and playing in bands and touring and, and whatnot. That was sort of my main creative outlet besides design. There is a lot of cross, as I see it now, there is sort of a lot of crossover between design and music, but at this time I didn't really see it. These are sort of a handful of photos um, of just sort of my experience with music and touring and playing and recording and whatnot. So as Handheld Heart sort of evolved, I, I started being a part of sort of a network of other other artists and other kids who were not only releasing their own records, but releasing records of other bands that they felt sort of other people needed to hear. And it was kind of inspiring in a way to get involved into something that I really had no idea about. I didn't know what the process was about what I had to do to get a record out or, the rec or sort of the more business aspects of it. Um, a lot of the bands that are up here now were were much smaller bands than I've sort of been experiencing and releasing records with lately. But a lot of these were more limited edition vinyl releases. Some were 100, some were 200, some were 300, and whatnot. And not all of them were necessarily designed by me, but it was, it was more so that I was involved in sort of releasing the records. As, as sort of the label began to grow, I, I sort of outgrew the sort of wanting to release music and wanting other people to hear the music that I was releasing and became more interested in the, the design aspects and the more creative aspects of releasing a record. And I sort of outgrew caring about what the bands were and what they were saying and what they sounded like and cared more about what the records looked like. So. Over time, I would sort of have tug of war, being a sort of a feud with bands if they they wanted to design the record and I was going to release it. And if it was not up to sort of a standard which I thought was good, they we would sort of part ways. But and it it's sort of selfish in a way. But I think all designers are a bit selfish when it comes to that. If I was going to release this record and it was hideous, there was no way I would even think of listening to it, and I don't know how anyone else would. But the records I'm showing up here are, are the majority of them are, are older releases by the label. Once I sort of figured that I wanted to sort of pursue a education in design, I knew I would continue doing the label, but sort of slim it down a bit to maybe releasing one record a year or or if that. Um, I knew once I started school that it would, my, my time was going to be limited for that. So I started CalArts in 2000, as it said, and it was the only school that I, I, I applied to. And the reason was, was I, I grew up fairly close to the school and, and was familiar with the curriculum a bit and familiar with other curriculums there. And, familiar with the campus, so I, I, I felt comfortable that if I was accepted and I was going there that it wasn't too much of a, of a shock. So these are some random shots of the studio, the outdoor studio, and sort of spaces. While I was in school, the, the, I was sort of new to the studio environment and this idea of collaborating with other disciplines and artists and other musicians, that it, it sort of became the priority over time. Sometimes these collaborative projects 
became more interesting than the studio studio sort of you know class assignments that we were sort of given and I sometimes would shift my focus to self-initiated projects with other designers or, or other artists. And it was, it was during this time that I, I felt that by doing these other sort of other projects besides the ones we were given that maybe like those could be connected to something that Handheld Heart could produce in the future. So it's, as, as school went on, we would I, with along with a, a series of other students, would generate posters sort of on a weekly basis in that we would, and it was exciting for us to do something other than our, our assignments in which we were able to sort of not only design but also generate content and, and also the, generate the production of them, whether they were screen printed or letter pressed or, or any other sort of um, printing technique. So, these are some various screen printing um, shots. So I, I started to get really interested in the idea of printing and ink on the page and various sort of techniques that were, could be used in the printing process. So I began to sort of explore more ways and, and see which, what we could do with sort of the facilities we had. CalArts doesn't necessarily really have the greatest of printing facilities um, as, as it may have used to have, but it sort of seems like it was an outdated trend when I, when I was there. Not as many people would pursue this sort of printing and screen printing with, with laser printers and large format full color printers that it seemed like almost a waste of a time to some people. So. This was a collaborative project and is sort of a, a long, ongoing um, project with a group that, uh, and a collective that I'm a part of called the Society of Image Makers, which we, we started at, at CalArts, and it's, it's a five of us now and one of the faculty members. And we've been working on this project for about five years, and what it is is we're reading the Journals of Lewis and Clark, all volumes, which is, uh, I think, 27 volumes, and trying to adapt each, each day to one visual image, whether that's a collage, a poster, a photograph, or, or be anything. But it's sort of dragged on for quite a while. These were four of the first posters that we did um, that were sort of representing their journey. Um, the first one to the left was more about their relationship and their what happened when they would sort of run into certain wildlife and what sort of food they were have. The second one is more about the landscape that they had to sort of and the terrain they had to experience. The third one is transcribing sort of some of the words and some of the language that they used in the actual journals. It's actually just sort of lifted um, with, with the actual uh, spelling typos because there was sort of a lot of inconsistencies in the journals on, on how they wrote. And the final one is sort of a, a portrait of Clark and some of his obsessions, some of his drawings, our drawings, but were more of his obsessions. And these are some more details of them. These are two other ones that are part of the Exciting of the series. These are all screen printed. <clears throat> Another collaborative project was a sort of a, a campaign to, to send out and wheat paste around the city to get people to remove their names from, from junk mail. Uh, it was kind of a, it's kind of still is sort of a nightmare to receive so much, uh, you know, junk mail and no one really knows what to do and what to sort of what the process is to get their name off of that list. So what we did is for a three month period we collected with with all everyone involved we collected all the junk mail that we could from various uh, students and various faculty members from the school and made our own paper with 
by wheat pasting and, and spray adhesiving the junk mail paper to large format newsprint pieces. And, and screen printing over the junk mail with these sort of sexual connotations, sort of phrases, and, and created a website in which you can sign up and get your name actually removed from the list. I'm not quite sure how successful it was because after we did it, we still were receiving junk mail. So not quite sure it was that effective, but we thought it would be. So moving on. Shortly after I, I graduated from CalArts, I started working at SciArc, which I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with, is a architectural school downtown. The, the, the school is sort of is an undergraduate and graduate degree program and, and is just strictly architecture, no, no graphic design at all. But I'm currently the institute designer and along with another designer, we sort of take on a lot of the duties of creating this sort of visual language and creating a, a brand out of the school's sort of identity. These are just various shots of the school. It's actually a, a quarter of a mile long and really, really narrow. At, at its widest point, it's uh, almost 60 feet. So there's only one pathway through the entire institute in that one, you only could go sort of east and west. There's no sort of go here, go upstairs, go to the right. There is a second floor, but it's a very partial part of the building. So it kind of creates a, a nightmare for anyone who's visiting. They don't know where to enter. They don't know where, where to exit, where to sort of do anything. Um, in the school, there is a, a, a gallery that, could everyone hear me? OK, this seems to get louder. Okay. There is a gallery that hosts a, an architectural installation every six weeks. For these installations, they're, they're very specific to the actual gallery space in that once the installation is done, they, they can't really move anyone anywhere else because they're designed specifically for that space. This is a shot of an exhibition that took place in 2006 by Daily Genick Architecture. This is just a, another shot of the hallway of the school. The projects at SciArc sort of range from, from large-scale projects to, to small-scale projects, some that take a day, some that take a year, some that cause a sort of sleepless nights, and some that sort of are, are a bit easy. Um, this was one of the first catalogs I did uh, for the Institute just after I started that was for an architectural drawing show that was going to take place at that did take place at the Pacific Design Center. And it was sort of a, they, before I started it, they told me that there was a very, very limited budget, but they were hoping to have a 64-page a catalog. Uh, when they told me the budget, I, I strictly s right away said, that's not even going to be able to make an eight-page catalog. I don't know how you think 64 pages is going to happen. And so I called the printer and told them what our budget was and said, we're hoping to have a 64-page catalog of some images. It's about drawing. It's about experimenting with drawing in, architectural, in an architectural sort of field. And he said, you're not going to be able to print anything with that money. So that's actually what I did. I, I, I made a 64-page catalog with no printing. It was 64 blank white pages that acted as a sketchbook for the exhibition in that if you came to the exhibition, you could take one with you, and that would hopefully inspire you to want to draw or to want to make something. And being that there was sort of no printing except for the cover, it was the hardest project I sort of ever had to do in explaining it to the printer that, no, we want no printing, just make a, make a book, and they couldn't wrap their heads around that. But it, it, it got done, and it confused a bit of people, but it ended up being okay. 
So this is the whole book, everything. <clears throat> a big part of, um, or sort of a, a inspiring part of working at SciArc is that we were able to sort of use the facilities that the, the, the students use for, for architectural models or for, for architectural building. We're able to sort of use these facilities to, to make design or to influence different ways of making sort of physical things. So I think the materiality and the physicalness of a lot of our projects that we do come out of the facilities that we have there. This is a, a 3D modeling, or this is a 3D milling machine that could mill on a X and Y radius. So as you can see here, it's milling um, three sheets of MDF. So by making these um, MDF bucks, which they're called, we're able to then pull a, a vacuum form with a really an eighth of an inch polyurethane plastic over the bucks to sort of make a, a semi-permanent signage for the school, which is some of the samples are shown here. And, and I have this picture of me holding it just to sort of give you another sense of the scale of some of them. Another sort of aspect of, of, of working at SciArc is that we we're constantly doing the same project and that we know every six months we're going to have to produce another, or every four months I should say, another lecture poster, another lecture series needs to be created. And so we're constantly sort of rethinking of ways to sort of promote that exhibition in a, in a similar fashion than than most institutes do, and then we're trying to present the information very clearly. But if there's another sort of way that could sort of speak about the materiality of sort of paper or the materiality or the format of how we're presenting the information, and how so, also how that can relate back to architecture in some way. This was a lecture series poster from 2006 um, that was was printed on a, a very, very thin paper. This is about 40 pound. Not, not as thin as, say, Bible paper, but very, very close. And it's sort of a nightmare for any printer to want to print a big 36 inch sheet on this size. It gets sort of jammed up in the press, and it, you, you waste quite a bit of paper. <clears throat> what we did was we wanted to sort of blur the boundaries between sort of an interior and an exterior and a, and a front and a back side of the poster. So all the information was printed on the back in a full bleed sort of black image and all the dates were printed on the front. So when it would hang on a wall, the, the content would sort of bleed through the poster as though it was the front side of the green was almost glowing and the back side was sort of lit. And this is it hung on a, on a, on a window, so it's, it's very legible. But if you hang it on a, on a white wall, it's, it's not clearly as legible, but it's, you could definitely see the names. It almost looks like you printed white on white, but it's, it's subtly showing through. <clears throat> the year after that poster, we, we did another one where we were hoping to sort of make something and deliver something that would, that someone would almost think and, and question what they were actually receiving, whether if it was a poster, whether if it was food, whether it was trash, or, or anything other than sort of a lecture series poster. And also something that hopefully someone could sort of engage in to, to get the content rather than just sort of look at it and hang it on the wall and not even hope to read it and just sort of move along. So 
what we did is with all 1,100 posters, we quickly sort of smashed them into a ball and crumpled them into a sort of a, a ball about as big as your hand. And it, it was sort of a nightmare. And it was printed on the same sort of paper that the previous printer was, the previous poster was printed on this really light sort of 40 pound text paper. And after we had it crumpled into a ball, we had them individually shrink wrapped into this very small, as you can see, sort of bag. And each poster was sort of individual and was different and sort of customized. But I think it caused a bit of a concern when it did get shipped because people had no clue what the, what the heck it was. But that was sort of our intention, so it was, it was kind of nice. So when they did receive it, they had to physically open it and physically uncrumple it and go through the whole motions just to sort of get the information, which ended up, I think, for the most part, being kind of successful. These are some details, as you can see. After it's crumpled and, and hung on the wall, it, it stays pretty flat. And it, it almost has a three-dimensional quality to it when it's on the wall, the way the, the sort of the light hits it and the light reflects off. And it also changes the nature of the paper. After it's been crumpled and uncrumpled, it, it almost feels like money in a sense. If you crumple money where it, and, and uncrump, uncrumple it, it, it's not as sort of paper-like. It's more fabric-like. And that's stuff we didn't predict. We had no clue that that would happen. It just sort of, just sort of happened. Um, <clears throat> another sort of project that sort of happens on a yearly basis is a, a poster for the, the Making a Meaning program for the Institute, which is a, an, an, a summer program for students who want to learn about architecture, but also want to learn the basics of model making and learn about materials and learn about very, very basic ideas in, in building and basic ideas of architecture. So what we try to do every time is take something that is part of that curriculum for that program and have that influence whatever it is we make. For this particular situation, we made these three-dimensional stick letters, which is sort of the first step in the model making of the program. You can see the scale of them. And those sort of emblems and that sort of projection and the phot photography of it ended up becoming sort of the, the logo and the sort of the image and sort of brand for that particular program for that year. That's the poster on the left, obviously. <clears throat> so as, as sort of handheld art, handheld art is obviously separate from Cyark, but as Handheld Heart sort of grew away from just releasing records, but became more of something that was an umbrella for anything I was hoping to generate, whether if it was music, or design, or a short film, or anything. I always intended it to be sort of a collaboration. So uh, I was never sort of stuck saying Handheld Heart is a record label or handheld heart is sort of a design studio. I like to just refer to it as sort of a collaboration so it could take on whatever life it wants to. One of the early projects that I did just after, our, or j still when I was in school, this was sort of the, one of the final projects um, be right before I graduated for a organization in Amsterdam called Lost and Found, which is a, a sort of one night event that uh, hosts, uh, hosts a night for film, video, slides, DVDs, and music, and design, and, and the sort of stuff that can't exist in a gallery. So if, if you wanted to perform your, your acoustic song, or you wanted your band to play, but it couldn't exist in a gallery. That's sort of what Lost and Found was. Um, my ideas for it were, 
at the time, there was a, a comet that, uh, I think it was called the Hermes Comet, was, had been lost for decades, like 66 years. It was, in the, it was in orbit, and it was sort of baffling scientists that they knew where it was, but it was out there. They just couldn't find it somewhere. And right around this time, it had, re it re it had resurfaced, and they found out where it was, and it was 19 million miles away, which sort of baffled me that you could find something that is that far away. I sort of found it intriguing. So the idea was to use a, a, a sort of pinpoint navigation, almost like astral navigation with, with astrology, to, to generate typography. So we, we pinned and made letter forms on the wall and sort of mapped it out with string, as, as you can see. And this sort of became not only the poster, but also a, a trailer for any sort of video that was presented at the, at the one night event. And this was, the, this was the only one that was actually held in Los Angeles at the time. They, they haven't, I don't think they've been back since. I'm going to switch now to the camera to show some publications. Um, let me switch up to here. like a hand model or something. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> the first uh, book I want to show is by a Dutch artist by the name of Lara Schnitger. She, she makes sort of large scale formats, large scale sculptures, I should say, um, by stitching and using... Can you, can you say? By, by collecting sort of materials and finding fabrics that she finds are unique and interesting and, and making these um, very large sculptures. Um, she has a, an interesting relationship with her work in that she, she refers to them as her kids and her babies and, and doesn't really refer to them as by their name but of the piece, but almost a name as if it was a child. I know she recently had a kid, so maybe that's changed, but <laughs> during, during the making of this book, she would constantly say, oh, can you move Susan over here? Can you move Timmy? Over? And I had no idea what she was usually talking about. But um, the idea for the book was to have the, the object of the book almost feel like a children's book in that the work... Um, we would m remove any sense of scale by shooting it on a color background. So you really had no idea how big these things were, uh, whether if they were 8 feet, 3 feet, or 10 feet tall. Um, we then sort of put them in an order that wasn't chronological, but was in order by size. So the, the, the biggest one came first. And we, and we ended with the, the smallest one. And the idea was that almost like, like they were children and then that the oldest, the oldest child was coming first. So I'll move quickly to the end. In the back, what we did was show one-to-one -one details to kind of give you a sense that if this was a one-to-one -one detail, that that sculpture is and must be at least eight feet tall. So it's a 
And then this is the final phase. The second book is by an a artist and filmmaker by the name of uh, William Jones. He made a, a short documentary, or a feature-length documentary, on uh, Latino Morrissey fans in and around Los Angeles. And while, while making the documentary, he also did a series of photographs. I'll start with the cover. So the book was, didn't accompany the exhibition, but rather came later um, once the exhibition sort of had already passed. So we were able to sort of spend more time with it and, and develop it more so. There was no sort of rush. So this was a project that sort of took longer than maybe it should have, but it ended up being OK. With the cover, what the idea was to do was to s sort of s show that obsessive quality of Morrissey and Smith's fans. Um, the tattoo, as you can see, is sort of a sort of a common thing with obs the obsessive Morrissey fans is that they don't only have tattoos of the band's name or Morrissey's name, but also album covers and and whatnot. And the, the idea was also to use an image that sort of was, you weren't quite sure on the gender, whether it was male or female. Um, it just seemed sort of feminine regardless. So, um, And the images were um, ordered in a way that was chronological by event. So when he was making his film, he sort of traveled around to different Morrissey-related events, whether if it was a Morrissey convention in New Mexico, M Morrissey convention in Hollywood or Texas or whatnot. So we organized it in that, s in that way. And after we sort of knew that the images were going to be in order by sort of event, there was, there was no way of sort of, of curating sort of what should come before what or whatnot. So what, what ended up happening was that all the figures in the photographs are constantly looking towards the center of the book, um, almost as though that's, that's where Morrissey is and he's on stage and they're sharing the same eye line. So as you can see. So that left us, once that sort of idea was developed, the design sort of, it sort of designed itself in a way. Um, and it also left us these sort of nice random white pages that sort of just would appear because if you came to an end of a section and there wasn't another image with someone looking to the left, you couldn't put an image. And this is the situation where you're still in the same section, but you get these sort of white pages because the content ended with looking to the right. These were still shots from the documentary. Um, and it, these still followed that, that rule of the subject matter sort of sharing the same eye line and looking towards the center of the book. Um, This is the, still is the first printing of the, the book. And what we did is for this, the color was actually the same color that was used on the first Smith's record. This is the PMS color that they use. And the idea is for the reprinting to, to change that color of the inside flap almost as though it's a, a limited edition like vinyl record where you get colored vinyl and you say, oh, I have the first pressing or the first printing. It's, The next one I want to show is a, a publication that I sort of just finished the, um, by a, a LA-based painter 
named Ross and Crow. Uh, let me see if I can get this. Uh, she she comes. Russ and Crow is is sort of a is her real name, but it's also sort of her her not her given name. Um, is that did that get darker? Yeah. Uh, um, I think she she prefers to to use this name as though it sounds much like a a country uh, country music performer. Um, she definitely has an obsession and an affinity for country music performers and the Midwest and sort of Western Midwest vernacular of So what we wanted to do for the cover was, in a way, reference not only the visual language of Western motifs, but also reference sort of boot saddles and horse saddles and whatnot by doing a a, a white on white. Um, blind emboss that that on, also shows the sort of texture of the Arlen paper. I don't know if you could see up too close, but everywhere where the the embossing happen, you lose this this texture quality of the paper. So I don't know if you, it has a, a sort of a three dimensional quality from the texture of the paper to also the texture of the letterpress. And the cover is supposed to act as though it is a, a stage, a performing stage. I think if she wasn't painting, she would probably wanting, want to be uh, on a Grand old Opry or something. Um, so, and this illustration was semi-based on a series of Time Life uh, Western books that talk about old saloons and old um, interior Western spaces. So. Um, the title of the book is called Night at the Palomino. The Palomino was a, a country music sort of honky-tonk venue that was in North Hollywood where not only country music perform, performers performed but also sort of not, I wouldn't say indie rock, but sort of smaller rock bands at the time. Um, and she, when she moved to LA from, from New York, she quickly became obsessed with this space. So it, it sort of inspired her in, in a lot of her work that she made for the book. This first image is an image of the Palomino. And the idea to use it first sort of came as though it was a, the title track of sort of a record. It was sort of the first thing that she felt could represent her sort of body of work for this, for this piece. Um, everything else sort of just came into that. Um, <clears throat> and the idea was to, to show her work in sort of the page like this, and then spreads later, show it in, a, in a, her studio setting to sort of reveal the massiveness of it, and that it is sort of 18 feet wide by 12 feet high. So d I think you, you don't get a sense of that by just seeing the printed image on the page. And then also to show some details. They're not to scale, but they are details. And the back of the book is very similar to the front, um, only in fact that the curtain is sort of down and the stage is closed and sort of the idea that the, 
performance is uh, over. So this is the this is a was sort of a interesting project in that not only because of its title, um, anytime someone would ask, oh, what are you working on? Oh, I'm working on the Black Pussy book. It sort of caught people off guard, and I actually was in a in a a meeting at SciArc, and someone had come in to deliver me images for the book, and on the folder it said really big Black Pussy, and they handed me the the disc, and I think it caught everyone off guard. That <laughs> what, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so what the Black Pussy is, is a, was the final works of uh, the artist Jason Rhodes before his uh, untimely sort of death in 2006. It was a sculpture that he made that existed in a warehouse in you see that in just outside of Silver Lake. It was a large warehouse, and it was the sort of the third part in a series of works that he was completing. And what he did with the sort of the Black Pussy was turned it into a cabaret sort of soiree events, a series of ten events, um, which were invite guest list only events that were very structured and very specific to what time you had to arrive, to what you had to wear, and, and what time when you got there, what time you would eat, and, and whatnot. So it was very well organized by him. And what he wanted to happen with it was he wanted people to sort of experience his sculptures in a way, to sort of live in his sculptures for one night. It, it, and it included sort of a whole range of sort of events throughout the night, uh, whether it was musical performers or comedians or him um, galloping around on stage, sort of uh, searching for um, slang words for uh, Black Pussy. He, he collected, uh, I think it was around 1,800 words um, slang words for, for that, but so you could see some of them here. Um, I don't want to go too much into the detail of his work, but um, what we wanted to do, this is a, f I don't know how well you could see it, but this is a full shot of the space. The idea for the book was to, to not only create sort of a document of all the soirees, but to do it in a way that was as disorienting as sort of the experience was. Um, whether when, you know, by, by doing this, what we could do was almost treat it as though it was like Pink Floyd the Wall or something where there was a linear narrative, but it was broken up by these sort of abstract um, shots of the installation itself. Um, and he also, curated his invite list to sort of B-list celebrities and um, uh, musical performers that were not really the, uh, that's not really Bono, that's a sort of a Bono look-alike. <laughs> but I think he liked that idea that if someone come, they came to the event, they would maybe think that was Bono. Um, so it was, it was, it was an interesting sort of affair in that people were just sort of mingling around uh, doing, doing nothing really but watching him a lot of times and watching bands play. So a lot of these images are sort of tell a specific story but like I said are, are broken up by abstract details of the shot. Of the space, and I don't want to go through it too much, but it's kind of massive.
And this, this all took, took place with editing down from about 30,000 photographs down to, I think there's 874 in the book. Um, and the sad part about it was it was completed. Um, I, I had the book completed but was collaborating on the cover um, image with, with Jason. And the night I, I sent it to him to sort of get final approval, that was, that was sort of the end. I didn't, he had passed away that, the day before that. So he never really saw the actual book made. Um, the book was completed and done and designed after that and didn't come out until over a year after his death. So for me, a lot of the images sort of changed meaning um, after he passed away. Uh, the book took on a completely different life and a completely different tone. Um, The, the disorienting factor that I was talking about with the book was a lot of the images that we, we used, we would change the orientation so you literally would, it would almost look like a mistake or you just would turn the book around and rotate the book and flip the book to see the direction of a lot of the images. And it was another situation where the printer thought it was a mistake and fixed the proofs, and then when we got them, we said, uh, you, you fixed our, uh, these weren't intentional mistakes, and it, it was another thing that confused them. Why do you want to have images upside down? And sometimes the printers just don't get it, I guess. So it, the, it starts with Jason and, and ends with, with Jason in the end. And the, 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 the sculpture actually moved to, to New York in November to be exhibited. And I think it just came down or comes down this week. And I don't know where it goes from there. But I think I'll show one more. And then I probably didn't quite get it. This was the catalog for um, another LA artist named Mark Lacari. Um, it's called Drawing with an Appetite. <clears throat> what we wanted to do was sort of create an environment or create a world, treat the book as though it was, it was in a universe in which all his work lived. Um, he, he draws these sort of very detailed, um, drawings of, of, of all sorts of, not, not abstract, but sort of uh, animals and appetites and universes. And so the book in itself ended up becoming sort of a, a universe. Um, let me, and I'm going to move quickly to the back to show the mapping of the book. Um, this drawing essentially became the linking of section to section throughout the book uh, by sectioning out certain types of works and certain sort of environments that they could live in together. And it was sort of a nice way to, at least for me, to wrap my head around all his work and have it fit into some sort of system rather than just being sort of visual soup. Um, By using this sort of um, illustration, we came up with the sections um, of sort of every type of work that would be shown throughout the book. Um, and it not only shows sort of these given names for the sections, but also what sort of um, context those sections lived in. So if portraits of Ed Hamilton or Pliny and Hiccups was actual work from an, an exhibition that had previously taken place, we would note it over here. 
So you could read about the type of section, read the sort of given name for that section, and then over here read about the type. So the book also has a lot of um, full-scale posters that pull out and unfold within the book. Um, this is a page that it, it's revealed in the previous page here, the door, the detail. And as you pull it open, you see the full piece. Here. Which you can't pull it out with the camera, but I think you get the idea. So those, those sort of situations happen throughout, randomly throughout the book, depending on the content of each section. This is another one that's almost National Geographic-like in that it pulls out this way. And I don't know if you could get the sense of how this, this works, but on this side, it's quite, quite large. But you, you have this whole drawing that comes across the whole page like this and turns into the structure of the book. And then as you turn this around, it ends on this page. So you actually see the ending before you see the beginning. And it's a way of, of using the interior sort of structure of the book as in a similar way that he sort of uses by uh, his, does his, a lot of his drawings by sort of drawing on the edge of a wall or running stuff through a crack on the ground or um, sort of revealing those, those parts, architectural parts of the book. These are just continuing in more, more sections of the same thing. The, and the grid structure for the book um, was, was developed and created based on the way that he sort of organizes and hangs his work on a wall where it's, it's, not, it's gridded in a, in a sort of loose fashion. And it's, as you can see, sort of not all aligned perfectly. So we use that as an idea to sort of organize work throughout, his, throughout the book, which to some it may look like it's a mistake or messy or not considered, but it was sort of carefully considered. Uh, just looseness. And this is a flap that comes off. Take a look. And that's it. <laughs> no more.